if you were to know a Pharisee uh, in the time of Christ, uh, you would have had to surmise that they were probably some of the finest men Israel ever produced. Uh, they were um, well-kept, well-dressed, kind, and knowledgeable in the ways of God. Uh, they knew the Torah, the Old Testament. They knew the prophets. Um, they knew the, uh, the oral law, uh, the Mishnah. Uh, they obeyed the law uh, in a punctiliar, fastidious fashion. I mean, if anybody was zealously committed to God, it was those men, externally speaking. Uh, they were called, in Hebrew, uh, the word for Pharisee uh, is hasadim. Uh, and every time you would say their name, hasadim, uh, it meant the pious ones. That's what they called themselves. Um, when I moved to my first church, the teller at the bank asked me, I hear you're one of the pastors at the, the church just down the block. What should we call you? And I said, well, your holiness, that'll work really good. <laughs> uh, she looked at me and started laughing like that's not going to happen. But the Pharisees were dead serious. Call me Hasidim, the pious ones. Uh, they believed that their holiness uh, came directly from their external obedience to all the dictates of the law. They obeyed, supposedly, the Ten Commandments fastidiously and the 613 additional Levitical commandments in the Torah, along with the Mishnaic law. They were extremely obedient to the external things, but they downplayed in the intention to the internal man, the spiritual man, because for them, spirituality was measured based upon your outer performance, not your inner performance. Along comes Jesus who begins to explain to them, uh, you have a, a measurement problem. You measure spirituality based on external behavior. I measure uh, spirituality based on internal behavior. Jesus told a story in the book of Luke chapter 18 to illustrate that point. Here's what he said. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood who was praying thus to himself. Notice the narcissistic nature of his prayer. God... Oh, I thank thee that I am not like other people. What are they? Swindlers, unjust, adulterers. And then he probably opened one eye. You ever look, at, look around when you're praying? Sees the tax gatherer there and goes, this IRS agent over here, they steal from everybody. I am glad I am not like him. It's, it's, it's a Marty paraphrase. Just go with it. <laughs> and then he throws in just how great he was, spiritually speaking. What's he do? Well, I, I fast twice a week. Uh, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get. Uh, but on the other hand, you had the tax gatherer standing some distance away. He was unwilling to even look up his eyes into heaven. So which is an intimation as the Pharisees looking up into heaven, explaining how great he is to God. But the tax gatherer who was known in that culture as being the one you hated because he stole all your money by exorbitant taxation. Uh, he was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast. And what was he saying? God be merciful to me, a what? A sinner. I know what I am. Jesus says, I tell you this, that one man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. If anything we need to understand this morning, that's God's standard of measurement. He doesn't look at the external he doesn't care how many times you fast in a given week. He doesn't care if you're very uh, meticulous in how much you tithe or what you do spiritually speaking. He cares about the inner man. Does it have a relationship with the Messiah or not? He said one man went home, well, still had his sin. Another man, man went home, a changed man. Which are you? Internal versus external measurements for spirituality is what Paul's going to talk about in Romans chapter 2. Uh, and it's very interesting what he's going to say here. He's going to ask, uh, uh, answer a, a background question that uh, arises from a reading of the text. And the question is this. In light of what we just studied in chapter 1 about the sin of the Gentiles, the Goyim, in light of all of their sin, uh, how does God respond to a real moral religious person? Because we just saw the degradation of sin in chapter 1. That God's wrath is revealed against all kinds of sin. Sexual and otherwise. And it just degenerated. Remember three times God said, if you sin at this level, you degenerate down to this level. If you continue to that level, I give you over to your sin. I continue to give you over to your sin. He says it three times. I give you up. When you get to chapter 2, now he has a Jewish audience here. 
he's writing his letter to. And I'm sure the Jewish audience is looking at Paul's uh, condemnation of the Gentiles or, you know, in, in the Roman culture. And if they're a good Jew, they're looking at Paul's condemnation in chapter 1 of the Gentiles. And they're saying what to themselves? Oh yeah, go get them Paul. That's the goyim. We always knew that they were bad. Gentiles can't trust them. They're not like us. We have the Torah. We have the prophets, the Nebaim. I mean, we've, we've got the, the Shema. We've got everything. I mean, we are God's people. We're going to heaven because, well, my grandmother was Jewish. My great-great-grandfather was Jewish, etc. Paul's going to address them in chapter 2. And, he, and it's going to take us several weeks to move through this. But he's going to... He's going to tell you how does God respond to the real moral religious person in their own eyes. Number one, he's going to tell you, first of all, that God supplies the reason for his divine judgment against the moralist, against the spiritual person. Notice what he says. Therefore, based on what I just said in chapter one, Paul says, therefore, in light of all the sin of the, of the Gentiles, therefore, you, Jew, are without excuse. If you're a Jewish person reading this, you're probably thinking to yourself, now, I don't know the Hebrew word for huh, <laughs> but it's probably something like that. They're probably reading this going, oh yeah, amen to that, and amen to that, and God gave more to this, amen to that, I've seen it. And then he turns around and goes, and therefore you, you Jew, are without excuse before God. Huh? What do you, what, 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 what do you mean? That's what he's going to do. How do I know that you are Jews? Because I read the rest of the chapter. Uh, because if you read the rest of the chapter, chapter 9, or chapter 2, verses 9, verse 10, verse 17, he says he's talking to Jewish people. And what are they thinking? What I just told you they're thinking. I mean, Paul's telling them, uh, you, religious external moralist, religious person, you're without excuse if you've rejected Christ. He didn't care about all this external stuff. He doesn't care how, much, how many verses from the Torah you can quote. He only cares about Messiah, do you know him, as Savior. And he's going to tell them, if anybody should have known that Jesus was the Messiah, you should have known. I mean, think about it. I mean, like what kind of evidence did they have? I mean, could a Jew stand before God and say, I had no idea, no idea. What does he tell them? You should have had an idea. All through the prophets, I foretold that one's coming greater than Moses. All through the, the prophetic writings, I told you explicitly what the Messiah would be like. I mean, we're talking prophecies off the, off the grid. Isaiah 7, he's going to tell us when he comes, he's going to be Emmanuel or God with us. In chapter 9 of Isaiah, he says when the Messiah comes, he'll be from the Davidic line. He'll be the eternal God that's coming. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he says he's going to come, be born, the eternal one, in the little city of Bethlehem. And, and on and on he goes. Isaiah 53, he says, I'm going to explain to you that when the Messiah comes, he will die for the sins of all mankind. Isaiah 53. I remember sitting down with my Jewish uh, sister-in-law after Liz's sister died uh, from cancer at 33, her twin sister. I did the funeral. And my Jewish sister-in-law uh, came uh, to our house after the, after the service uh, on our way back uh, to San Francisco area. And we've never had a theological discussion, but she, she wanted to have one that day because of what just happened. 33-year-old mom of two little girls under three died of cancer. And... Um, and we talked, and I, and I said, let me talk to you about Jesus from the Old Testament, because he's everywhere. And I remember explaining to her Isaiah 53, and my Jewish sister-in-law, Martha, said, I have never heard this before. <laughs> She's a secular Jew. She thought she was okay. I said, well, it says the Messiah is going to come die for the sins of all of us. Anyway, Jesus says, or through the pen of Paul, uh, if you are a Jew, but you've rejected the Messiah, you are without excuse on judgment day. You can't stand there and go, uh, I'm from the tribe of fill in the blank. Doesn't matter. See, I know this is Jewish thinking because Paul says it is in this chapter. He's going to debunk the thinking. And uh, William Barclay, uh, he is liberal in his approach to some things of theology. So he, he, will, he will tend to deny miracles, which is, you know, really. But he's great on cultural information. Here's what he says about the cultural background of chapter 2. Quote, says they, the Jews, thought that they occupied a privileged position. says God might be the judge of the Gentiles, but he was a special protector of the Jews. Here, he says, Paul is pointing out forcibly to the Jews that they are just as much sinners as the Gentiles, from chapter 1, and that when they are condemning the Gentiles, they're condemning themselves. He says they will be judged not on their racial heritage, but on the kind of lives that they lived. 
The Jews, he said, always considered themselves to be specially privileged with God. Here's some ancient quotes from Barclay that Jews used to say. God loves Israel alone above all the nations of the earth. Uh, they used to say, God will judge the Gentiles with one measure and judge the Jews with another measure. They used to say, all, all Israelites will have a part in the world to come. All of them. And then they used to say, Abraham sits outside the gate of hell. And any wicked Jew that approaches hell, he tells them, no, you need to go to heaven. So Abraham stops them. Erroneous. Isn't it interesting when it comes down to judging ourselves, we tend to loosen what God tightens and tighten what God loosens. We are really good at judging other people, but we're not really good at judging ourselves. And Paul says, you need to stop and consider that on judgment day, it's got nothing to do with bloodline. It's got everything to do with, is your life covered by the blood of Christ? Everything. He's going to judge you definitively. Notice what he says, the rest of verse 1. He says, every one of you, speaking to the Jewish people, who passes judgment on the Gentiles, he says, for in the, that you judge another, uh, you have condemned yourself. Why? You're doing the same thing. <laughs> you're doing the same things. You're, you're looking at the Gentiles and saying, they're doing all these things in chapter 1. But he said, you're condemning them and you're guilty of the same things. One of the most uncomfortable things to read uh, is, uh, it's in, if you're honest, is Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And when I take people to Israel... We standing uh, in that same area where there's only one amphitheater built into the hill line overlooking the Sea of Galilee where Christ would have preached this message. So we have a Bible study. It's awesome to stand there. Jesus' message uh, to the Sermon on the Mount, his first message, uh, is going to say multiple times, you have heard, but I say to you. When he says you have heard, he's saying this is what the Pharisees taught. But I say to you, this is what God says. So he says, this is how they look at life and how measure, you measure life and spirituality. But this is how God measures it. So we all know the drill. Uh, the Pharisees said, you have only committed murder if you actually did it. What Jesus comes along and says, well, I say to you, if you have hate in your heart, you committed it. And you might sit there and go, well, I, I, never, I would never murder anybody. You do it every time you drive in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Let somebody cut you off. Let somebody like a guy last night ride your bumper too closely. What do you want to do with your brakes? <laughs> I'm just being honest. You want to pump your brakes so he gets a little closer and, yeah, I showed him. And that's the Christian thing to do. You know, <laughs> Jesus said, and let me, I'm going to tell you, you guys say I haven't committed murder, but I see the hate in your heart that you have for the Gentile. You're murderers. Jesus comes along and says, um, let's evaluate what adultery is. What's the Pharisees say? I've only committed adultery if I've actually had somebody other than my wife. What's Jesus say? Mm -mm. If you lustfully look upon another woman who's not your wife, you have committed adultery. He looks at the interior. The Pharisees would come along and say, well, when you give your alms, you know, you tithe, make sure you make a lot of noise at the temple when you drop it in that horn-shaped uh, tithe box and it drops into the box. You can make a lot of noise there. Make a lot of noise. And that shows how holy you are. Jesus says, no, when you give your alms, make sure your right hand and your left hand don't even know what the other one's doing. Don't draw attention to yourself at all. See, God judges differently than we do. He judges the internal, not the external. What do you do? Do you just look at, well, my life looks, it's pretty good. I'm pretty moral. I'm pretty religious. I do this, I do that. But if you rejected Christ, you're without excuse. This is what Paul says. Uh, I'm, I uh, remember we lost power last week. We didn't have church. That was weird. I was sitting at home with nothing to do on a Sunday. That was just bizarre. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up my last two doctoral classes uh, so I can graduate in April with my doctorate in apologetics. So I've taken two, two final classes. So I finished one class about a month ago. I finished it two months early, but I worked hard to finish it. Uh, and I, uh, I had 3,000 pages I needed to finish since Christmas. So I it was a reading weekend, so I finished reading uh, all, you know, I, I had to read all the, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, all the Christian science literature, all the Jehovah's Witness writings. I mean, it was, it was 3,000 pages of interesting original source material. So I finished all that last weekend, and at one point I was kind of relaxing, reading The Watchtower. Because <laughs> it was part of, you know, my paper I was writing, because I had to write four different papers too, so... Uh, I'm on my fourth paper, so I'm almost done. Praise God. Now I sit at home at night with no reading to do, thinking, oh, this is awesome. But last week I was reading the Watchtower magazine, and I have family members that are Jehovah's Witnesses. 
So I understand where they're coming from. Uh, the title of the article that I was reading uh, was, At Which Table Are You Feeding? That's the title of the article. Which table are you feeding? The article uh, warns Jehovah's Witnesses to steer clear of apostate Jehovah's Witnesses who have partaken of the food of demons. Well, oh, this should be interesting. What's the food of demons? Well, here's the food of demons. Quote, I'm quoting from that magazine. To what have the apostate Jehovah's Witnesses returned? In many cases, they have re-entered the darkness of Christendom and its doctrines, such as the belief that all Christians go to heaven. Unquote. I'm reading that going, oh, wait, wait, I missed something. I missed that. What did I, what did I miss? You know, I've, I've read the New Testament before. I've studied it. I don't think you can read through the Gospels and not figure out that everywhere it says that if you're a sinner and you believe that God is, Jesus is the Savior, what happens? You're saved. You are saved. He cleanses your sin. He washes you clean. He gives you a new life. It's everywhere. I'm writing down all the verses in, you know, in the watchtower. Right now, hey, you need to read the Bible. <laughs> what did they say? Anybody that believes that, that's demonic food. You know, they're going to be shocked on Judgment Day. They are going to be shocked because they're like a Pharisee who've created things that God never created and said, obey these and you're good. And they're going to be shocked because on Judgment Day, what words are they going to hear? You are without excuse. You should have known better. Should have known better. The book of Hebrews tells you about the power of the cross. I love chapter 9, verse 24. It tells you the power of the cross for a sinner who repents. It says, for Jesus did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place once a year uh, with his own blood. And it's not his own on Yom Kippur. He says, uh, otherwise he would have entered, he would need to have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he, the sacrifice, has manifested himself to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He is the ultimate sacrifice. He's Isaiah 53. He laid his life down to redeem us. And any sinner that comes to God based on faith and his ability to save is saved. And he's not eating demonic food. He's eating God's food. And that faith saves and that faith redeems. You have to ask yourself a question. Uh, if you're a religionist, a spiritual, moral type person, but you've rejected Christ, what's your standard of measurement? What's your standard of measurement? God knows your standard of measurement. Second thing Paul tells us is how does he deal with a religious person uh, who's rejected Christ? He says God supplies the rightness of his judgment against that person. He tells you my judgment against you is correct, not incorrect. Notice uh, Romans 2 verse 2 it says, but we know that the judgment of God is according to what? Is it up there? You're so quiet. Are you guys still asleep? I got here at 7.50 this morning. They were hyperventilating that I was going to make it this morning. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yeah. I thought it was 10 to 7. Um, what does he say? But we know that the judgment of God is according to a little evidence here and there. No. To truth. To truth. It's according to truth uh, against those who practice such things. Which means God is not prone to make mistakes. In fact, God never makes mistakes as a judge. Ever. Are you a parent? Have you ever made a mistake as a judge between children? Yeah, since my sister's not here, we can talk about her. Marla? Uh, we, we were tight. Marla and Marty, I think my mom had her when she was 17, had me when she was 18, knew my mom in her 20s. I remember conversations, I am so old and I'm 27. I'm thinking, yeah, you are. I mean, you know. My sister, we, you know, we kind of bantered and had fun with each other. But uh, she would occasionally, because she sat to my right and my dad to my left, uh, she would stab me in the rib cage with a fork. <clears throat> I didn't do anything. And she was a sweet little blonde, you know, perfect little child. And then I would, you know, I would retaliate, right? And then my dad would retaliate. And then I would say, whoa, I mean, why, why am I getting disciplined? You cannot push your sister, you know, you cannot hit your sister. She just stabbed me. I didn't see it. <laughs> I would say my dad's judgment of those situations was erroneous. <laughs> and I, all my life, I'm carrying this around, you know. Well, not long before my dad died of brain cancer, my sister came clean. Hey, dad, you remember? Yeah. I was like, I told you. <laughs> See, our judgment can be totally erroneous, can it? We don't have all the facts. God has all the facts. He never looks down and goes, oh, whoa, could you come back in here? That judgment I just gave concerning you, it just wasn't totally 
You know, there's some other evidence we need to consider. No, he's got it right every time. Why? It's pretty simple. He's omniscient. He's omniscient. See, since he's omniscient, he can get behind the facts of a situation and present the evidence. And not just that, he can, he can analyze the motives for why something was done. My fork just slipped. Right. For 10 years. You know? <laughs> Don't you have a sister or brother you banter with? I do. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's what uh, Paul says about God's judgment. Verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the things hidden in the darkness. And this is most, un you want to just like unloosen the tie at this point. And he will disclose the what? The motives of men's hearts. Huh? See, you can deceive me all day long. You deceive your wife, your husband. You can deceive a police officer. You can deceive a judge. But when you stand before God as the judge without Christ's blood covering your sin, God says, I look at you in my omniscience, and I, don't know, I only don't just know what you did. I know the motives behind why you said what you said and did what you did. He judges perfectly. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, ends with uh, this word of warning. It says, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. He'll bring it forth. I tell you, I'd rather stand with the blood of Christ covering me on judgment day than to stand there with just my own works. And then he, he doesn't show any favoritism either. First Peter tells us this, verse 7, chapter 1, First Peter. And if you address uh, as the father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. How, we're all, none of us are getting out of here alive. You understand this, right? Do you understand? None of us are. We all have to be prepared. So what's Peter say? As you're making your earthly sojourn, you should live with reverential fear that one day you stand before God Almighty, either prepared or not prepared. You stand there one day. And he says, when he judges you, he's impartial. Do you think God's going to look at you when he calls your name alphabetically? I'm sure it's highly organized. <laughs> and he gets to the Aleph, the Beit, the Gimel, the Dalit. When he gets to your name, it's going to be Hebrew, I'm just telling you. When he gets there and he calls your name, do you think he's going to look at you and the angel's going to go, hello, Lord, it's Yehuda, and wow, what a financial portfolio this man had on earth. Do you, do you think God's going to even care? No. No. Um, you think the person's going to, this person went to Harvard and Yale. They have two master's degrees, a PhD. Oh, Lord. They are, you think the Lord's going to go, I must reconsider their judgment. What's, what's God going to say at that point? Harvard, Yale, are you kidding me? He should judge both those schools, right? They left their theological moorings. But it's not going to matter anything to God because he shows no partiality. It doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't matter how much you were. It doesn't matter the car you drove, the house you had. None of it. He's impartial. He's impartial. Shows no favoritism like judges on this planet. You ready for that day? It says in verse 3, Paul says, let me explain to you how God shows you that his judgment's true. He says, do you suppose this? O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same thing that yourself, that you will actually escape the judgment of God? I mean, have you so deceived yourself? Did you think that you're going to get a pass on that day? When you've been doing the same things? Living in the D.C. area has been most instructive for the last 10 years. Because we've had different, you know, the Democrats are in control, the Republicans are in control. I mean, I've seen both in action, you know, and they all have issues, do they not? You know, and you see people demonstrating for this and demonstrating for that and burning this and burning that all for the sake of righteousness. I'm like, are you kidding me? Deceit, sexual sin, all the things that go on. And I look at this and think, yeah, Paul's words are absolutely true. Do you think that you who are condemning somebody else for this, that God's not looking at you and going, you're guilty of the same things, just nobody knows? Sure he knows. So he says in verse 4, this is most instructive. He says, do you think lightly? Do you think lightly of the riches of his? Notice these three Trinitarian things. Do you think lightly of God's, what's the first one? Kindness, Kindness forbearance, and patience. Now, for our culture, in case you, how many use the word forbearance every day? I was just forbearing you. Uh, we don't use that anymore. So, for our culture, put the word tolerance in there. Uh, do you think lightly of his kindness, tolerance, and patience towards you? Not knowing, because you're clueless, that the kindness of God leads you to what? 
repentance. There should be a word in there in my estimation. It should read something like this. Not knowing that the kindness of God should lead you to repentance. What's he saying here? Well, let me do another Marty Baker paraphrase. What's he saying there? What's Paul saying there? You mean to tell me that you're looking at your life, your financial portfolio, your education, how great your marriage has been, all the kids you've got, the grandkids you've got, beautiful home that you've got. You mean to tell me you're looking at all the blessings of God and you're surmising that you're okay and you've rejected Christ? Have you deceived yourself into thinking that God's tolerance of your life thus far, because you've not seen a lightning bolt come down, is acceptance of your lifestyle? What's the answer? It's a rhetorical, uh, no, no, no. What's Paul saying? That you are taking advantage of three things. God is kind to you, even though you've rejected him. He's tolerant toward what you're doing, and he's patient with you, but he's only doing those three things for one main reason, that one day you wake up to the fact that you need to repent. When I think about America, this is what I think. Why has God been so good to us? Why has he been so tolerant of us? Why has he been so patient to us? Well, what was Billy Graham's message? You need to, it was a simple message, wasn't it? You need to turn to Christ. They need to turn to Christ. Maybe it's the day that you need to turn to Christ because you've despised God's blessing on your life and took that as an okay that he is, he's good with you. No, he's merely waiting for you to repent and turn to him as, as the Savior. I'm going to show you a town that never got the picture. Uh, it's in Israel. It's on the um, north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I'll show you a couple of pictures to explain Chorazin to you. Uh, when I take people to Israel, we always go to Chorazin. Uh, this is a picture uh, looking from the, uh, what's the ascent up to the Golan Heights. Uh, looking, uh, you're looking uh, west, uh, back toward the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and that little city off in the misty uh, background there, that's Capernaum, where Jesus did much of his ministry, where Peter had his boating fishing uh, industry was there. Uh, and so Chorazin was a beautiful place. It had, a, it had the, the seat of Moses was there. Uh, for the law to be taught there. Here's some more photos to explain to you the beauty of Chorazin. Uh, they had a wonderful synagogue there. It was very ornate. Uh, you can see they took a lot of time to, they didn't get this at Home Depot, by the way. I mean, this is carved by hand in their synagogue. Here's some more pictures of the synagogue. Uh, these are some of the, the capitals and the columns that were there. It was a beautiful synagogue. So we, we have a Bible study there inside the synagogue. It's quite awesome as you're standing there and looking at the Sea of Galilee in front of you. Here's some more photos of Chorazin. This one's interesting. If you take a glass of water, uh, and this is from one of the capitals that uh, was on one of the uh, parts of the, of, the, of the synagogue. If you pour water on that, uh, you will see that it's the face of Medusa. Hmm. What's the logical question? <laughs> it's a synagogue. What's the logical question? What's Medusa doing it's carved in stone in the synagogue? Huh? I mean, wouldn't you like freak out in the new building if we open it and I've got all these mythological... <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You'd be thinking to yourself, who designed this? Where were the elder council? There's Medusa as we walk in. See, Medusa is a part of their synagogue. Now, now what's other, another thing that's interesting about the uh, synagogue uh, is they orientated it the wrong direction. Because uh, the way it was supposed to face is where the Bema seat, the judgment seat, where the Torah was read, everything. That was supposed to be at the, on the end that faced Jerusalem, the temple. They flipped it around. It's backwards when you walk in. Why? Because it's in the face of God. Why? Oh, we in Chorazin are tolerant of all faiths. So much so that, well, we've got the Torah and the prophets and everything, but we love Greek mythology and we don't want to offend anybody who loves Medusa. So we'll just carve her into the stone of the church. Jesus did many of his miracles here to prove he was the Messiah to these people. What does he say to these people? Well, let's read what Jesus says to Chorazin. Kind of ominous words. Matthew 11. Then he began to reproach the towns where most of his mighty deeds had been done. You know, like giving eyesight to people that you knew had been blind since birth, new legs to people you knew were paralyzed since you were in grade school, etc. Uh, since they had, they had not repented. All this evidence, but they hadn't repented. What did Jesus say to them? Woe to you. 
Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, a sister coastal city there on the Sea of Galilee. For if the mighty deeds have been done in your midst, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, uh, they, along the coast, uh, would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. If they had seen what you've seen, they would have come to me in faith. But you haven't. He, he goes on to tell them more on the next slide as we read. There was another slide. Did he change it on me or it didn't change it on me? Did he change it? Okay. Uh, what's he tell them? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm 60 now. This is what happens. He says, but I tell you, it's more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And as for you, Capernaum, the coastal city where Jesus did most of his ministry, uh, will you be exalted to heaven? Really? He says, no, you're going to go down to the netherworld or to hell. Uh, he says, for if the mighty deeds that were done in your midst have been done in Sodom, uh, it would have remained until this day. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah would have seen my miracles, they would have repented on the spot. But you've seen them over and over again. He says, but I tell you, it will be more tolerable because God is just and judges you based on light received and your rejection of said light. It will be more tolerable in the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. He just condemned these towns and one of them was Chorazin. They should have known better. I wonder what it was like when they stood before God, when they went to go meet him. Well, you have two options. They probably heard the words, you are without excuse. That's not the word I want to hear from the Lord. I, w I want the other word from the Lord. I don't know what you're living for. I only want to stand before Christ and hear him say one thing. You know, you know what it is? Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, well, well done, good and faithful servant. That's it. That's it. You can have, you have no excuse. You should have known better. You should have come to me. You had all the evidence to come to me, but you did not. Or well done. I don't know where you stand today, spiritually speaking. Your standard of measurement might be erroneous. Maybe for the first time in your life, you see it's not tenable. Uh, we have counselors who would love to tell you about the gospel of Christ that saves us all. Uh, because that's the best decision you'll ever make. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the power of the cross uh, and for how explicit Paul is. Uh, he speaks to all of us and, and shows us what is truth versus that which is error. May your gospel be powerful in our lives to where we share it with those about us and anyone among us who doesn't know you. Might this become the day that they trade kingdoms. In Christ's name, amen.